everybody, I am Jarrett Ross, a genie blogger, and on today's genealogy tutorial, I will be discussing genetic genealogy for people with Jewish ancestry. Genetic genealogy has been an absolutely game-changing tool that has come out quite recently. But for those with Jewish ancestry, genetic genealogy can be an extremely difficult path to take. Now, the biggest hurdle really has to deal with Jewish genealogy in general, and that's the fact that there's not a lot of documentation available for many Jewish families going back past the 19th century. So for many people, even if you do identify a significant match in your DNA matches, it may be near impossible to actually prove how you're related to them through the paper trail. But when it comes to Jewish genetic genealogy specifically, it's endogamy that really screws things up. Endogamy is defined specifically as the custom of marrying only within the limits of a local community, clan, or tribe. And even today, it's still a religious custom that those who are Jewish marry someone else who is also Jewish. But when talking about endogamy in terms of genetic genealogy, it's best to look at it as endogamy will cause people to be related to you in multiple ways. So basically, they're your cousin in a couple of different ways. Now, this does not necessarily mean incest. While it was a custom for hundreds of years that first cousins and second cousins marry each other, it wasn't necessarily that that causes endogamy as a whole. Now, what happens is if you're related to someone in multiple ways, that means that you're going to share more DNA than if you were just related in one way. So as an example, let's look at some numbers. Starting out, we're going to take a quick look at the shared Centimorgan project chart. And this shows the average amount of Centimorgans that is shared with certain relationship distances as well as a range of shared DNA within those certain relationship distances. And as you go further out in distance of relation, those numbers get smaller and smaller. By the time you get to a fourth cousin, you're averaging 35 centimorgans, and your range can be completely sharing nothing to sharing 127 centimorgans. For fifth cousins, you're looking at an average of 25 centimorgans, with a range of possibly nothing to 94 centimorgans, and then six cousins and seventh and eighth, you can see it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But with all of these, there's a possibility that you don't share anything. But let's say that maybe you find someone who's actually a cousin to you two different ways. They're your fifth cousin twice. So being that they're related twice, we can basically double the numbers that we have for the fifth cousin average. So they would be looking at an average of 50 centimorgans with a range of possibly nothing to all the way up to almost 190 centimorgans. So you're looking at a large chunk of that range being well over the typical range of a fifth cousin. So this person who is a fifth cousin in two ways will actually come up looking as a third cousin. Now anyone with Jewish ancestry who has done a DNA test and then seen the results of someone who isn't Jewish you've probably noticed that you had a lot more matches than they did. And the reason for that is because of this endogamy. You have a lot of people that are going to be related to you two, three, four, five different ways. You may never be able to find some of those relations through the paper trail. They may be eighth, ninth, tenth cousins in a whole bunch of different ways. And if you follow my videos, you probably saw my recent interview with Steve Jaron who is my proven 10th, 11th, and 12th cousins. Now here we have an example of family tree DNA matches. We have one column that shows the predicted relationship, and then we have another column that shows the proven relationship. And you can see the big differences. Now there are tricks to overcoming these problems of endogamy and identifying actual significant genetic matches. And that trick is really just focusing on the larger segments. Now this can be done in two different ways, and the way that you do it depends on where you've tested because the different sites give you different pieces of information. So depending on what information you get, you'll have to use one of the different methods. Now the reason why you wanna focus on segments to overcome endogamy 
has to do with how recombination and DNA inheritance works. With each generation, the DNA recombines, and so certain segments will get smaller and smaller, sometimes even completely disappearing. So when you're looking at endogamy, and you're looking at a relation where instead of being a fourth or third cousin as it seems, and they're really a sixth cousin, a fifth cousin, and a sixth cousin again, well, you're going to expect those segments to be a lot smaller than someone who is a true third cousin because that DNA has had fewer generations to recombine and get smaller. Now, these are not foolproof methods. This may cut out matches that are actually related to you in a non-endogamous way, and they could end up cutting out matches that you could actually figure out through the paper trail. So you don't always want to just focus on the matches that fit into these guidelines. Sometimes open it up a bit. But this is really going to help you to hone in first on those matches that you want to spend the time researching. The hardest thing about genetic genealogy is when you're looking at matches and you spend all this time trying to find the connection. But if you're an endogamous match, you may never find that connection. And spending all those hours for probably nothing is not something you want to do. So if you find a significant match, then you have a much better chance of finding that connection. The first method is the largest segment method. This method is really simple and it's just like what it sounds. You just sort your matches by the largest segment. The second method is the ratio method. This method, you want to look at a comparison of the total amount of shared centimorgans versus the total number of segments. And you want that ratio to be 10 to 1 or better. So if someone has 100 centimorgans of total shared DNA, and that's shared on 10 segments or less, then you have a significant match. But if you have someone where the total amount of shared centimorgans is 100, but the number of segments is 11 or higher, then that's usually a match that you kind of want to pass over and focus on others. Now, the way that you employ these methods depends on the website that you've tested. So I'm going to go through each website and talk about the different things that you can use to help you in identifying significant matches. The first website that I'm going to talk about is Ancestry DNA. For your genetic matches on Ancestry DNA, they give you the total number of shared centimorgans and the number of shared segments. So for Ancestry, we're going to be using that ratio method. Ancestry already employs what's known as the timber algorithm, which automatically cuts down on some of your endogamous matches. It does this by identifying segments of DNA that are so commonly shared among all different people that they then take that out of the DNA results. These are often known as pileup regions. And for anyone who's been on DNA Painter, you've probably seen a lot of the different markings which indicate areas of pileup regions. So because of this, sometimes I am a little bit more lenient with Ancestry. I will take a look at some of those people where maybe it's 100 centimorgans over 11 segments, but I don't go too far out of that line. For 23andMe, you will also be using the ratio method but it's a little bit different because with 23andMe's genetic match list, it gives you the total number of shared centimorgans as a percentage, and that gives you the total number of segments. If you go to the match page, you will see the total number of shared centimorgans as the actual centimorgan number and not just a percentage. But it can take up time having to constantly click into a page to get that number. So I often have the DNA Painter shared centimorgan tool out when I'm going through my 23andMe matches because I'm putting the percentages in so I can get a total number of shared centimorgans. Now for anyone who's really good with doing math in your head, 1% of shared DNA is usually about 75 centimorgans. So you can try to figure it out in your head depending. But one really nifty thing that 23andMe has is that you can actually sort your matches by number of shared segments. Now this will start with the highest number of shared segments and go down, but it will also start with the highest number of shared segments as well as the highest number of total shared centimorgans. 
So as you go down into each different number of segments group, when you look at the top of that group, you're going to get those with the highest number of total shared centimorgans within that group. So if you get to the group where it's 10 segments, you're going to want to find anyone who's matching you at a total number of 1.25% or more. Another great thing about 23andMe is if you look to the left side of your genetic matches list, you'll find a lot of different filters you can apply, but one that you can apply that's really helpful for Jewish genetic genealogy is an ancestral birthplace. For family tree DNA, you're actually going to be using the largest segment method. Family Tree DNA's genetic match list gives you the total number of shared centimorgans and the largest segment in centimorgans. The best thing to do is to then sort it going by the largest segment and then focus on any matches where you're sharing at least 100 centimorgans. Unfortunately, Family Tree is a little bit more difficult for those who come from Jewish ancestry or any other endocumous populations. And the reason for that is the same reason why you want to focus on any matches that are over 100 total shared centimorgans. Family Tree DNA's total shared centimorgan number includes lots of little segments. So that number that's 150 centimorgans may well actually be closer to 120 or 110 centimorgans because it's also counting a bunch of little one, two, or three, four centimorgan segments. Now when you're on Family Tree DNA, if you do find a significant match and you're worried that it might be endogamous and they're counting a lot of those small segments, you can then look at your comparison in the chromosome browser and put the segment threshold to seven centimorgans. This way you'll get a much better idea of how closely related you are to this person. Now the last of the big four, but not the last of the websites we'll be talking about in this video, is MyHeritageDNA. And in all honesty, it's my favorite when it comes to being able to look at your genetic matches. To start out, you can use either the ratio method or the largest segment method because it gives you all four readings of your shared centimorgans. It's giving your total number of shared centimorgans. It's giving that total number in a percentage. It's giving you your largest segment, and it's also giving you the total number of segments. So you can go any route to try to identify your significant matches. What's also great is that you can actually sort by the number of shared segments, or you can even sort it by the largest segment. And one interesting tool that I've actually found has been quite useful for me in overcoming endogamy problems with my matches on my heritage is that you can actually select people by the ethnicities that you share with them. What I do with this tool is I try to find matches where they only have a small percentage of Jewish ancestry, something that would mean a Jewish grandparent, great-grandparent, or great-great-grandparent. The reason for that is because you have a lot less endogamy playing with the DNA. And being that they only have one line of Jewish ancestry, you can usually get an idea in their family tree of where you're connected through. Now the last website we're going to discuss is GEDmatch. For GEDmatch, you're going to be using the largest segment method because they're giving you your total number of shared centimorgans and your largest segment. Now for GEDmatch, I do suggest using the beta version of the one-to-many matches. I'm not going to discuss the tier one version of the one-to-many, but for the one-to-many in the free version, it's best to use the beta because you can do a lot more in manipulating the shared amount of DNA. So you can actually make that threshold higher than seven centimorgans if you really want to hone in on significant matches. But what's also really great is that you can not only sort your matches by the largest segment, you can also sort them by the largest segment on the X chromosome. So if you're familiar with how to use the X chromosome to figure out what lines of your family this matches through, then you'll find this very useful in identifying significant matches through your X lines. Now everything that I've discussed in this video has been about how to identify your significant matches. But in all reality, that's the easiest part of this. The real hard part is figuring out how these matches are related to you.
Now the hope is, is that they will supply all sorts of information. They'll have a family tree connected to their DNA. They'll have different information about their ancestry. And hopefully they will be someone that you can easily contact. But that isn't always the case. Sometimes you'll have matches who haven't logged into their DNA results in years. So they're not going to see any messages that you send them. You may have matches that really just aren't that interested anyway. But even if they don't supply you with that family tree or they don't get back to you, you should try to build a tree for them. There are all sorts of ways to find somebody and to build out their tree and to actually figure out how you are related. But as you identify your significant matches, because there's problems with the documentation with Jewish genealogy, you have to often rely on a few other little tricks. And those tricks are identifying correlating pieces of information. The best thing to do is to look at your shared matches. If you've had a bunch of cousins who have tested on all these different sites, and you can then look at the shared matches and see if a whole bunch of cousins from one specific line of your family are matching the same person, it's very likely that that person is related through that side of your family. But sometimes this method will be very difficult because of endogamy. So with sites like Ancestry DNA, where you can't see how much your match is matching the shared matches, you can only guess. So sometimes you might have a shared match with someone from one line of your family and then another shared match from a whole different line. And you have no way of figuring out which one is actually closer related to this match. If one of your matches has a pretty big X chromosome match to you as well, then you can look into those specific lines from your X inheritance. And you can check out my video about the X chromosome to learn how to do this. But other than that, the thing you want to do as you build your matches tree is you want to look for shared surnames or similar surnames and shared ancestral origins. Now it can be a specific town, it can be a region. You really don't want to go as high as the country level because often the country lines changed. So a place that might be in Ukraine now may have been in Romania at one point and then in Russia before that and you might find different cities being all over the place. So, but the more specific you can get in the area that you're looking for matches, the better off you are. Thank you so much for checking out my video. If you enjoyed, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. You can also click right about here if you'd like to subscribe. It's completely free to do so. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Genie Vlogger. I'm the Genie Vlogger. See you in my next video.